I didn't know Anne that well before I came to Bayshore. Her story is real. Her story is raw. But I want you to hear her story because just like Brad this morning, just like me, and now just like Anne, there's more of us out there. There is more of us out there that are still on the other side. And we get and we understand that the Lord is calling us to mirror his image to them. And so, Anne, if you would share with us. Go for it. Oh, can you get that up here so I can, like, touch it? Because I get a little nervous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just to we also, yeah, do it right there. <laughs> Um, fair warning, and I joke about this, and I have to say the joke because my nerves are a little high, and now I'm seeing more people that I recognize, so it's a little higher. Um, I either, like, cry or I cuss, so I'm hoping the tears flow and not the curse words. <laughs> if they do, bear with me, but um, Andy and I have been talking for a while about um, me giving my testimony because it's a little intense, so I always start with that joke. If you hear a cuss word, just have grace, but... Um, He's right about our purpose for our life. God has created each one of us for a purpose. And the most revealing thing and the most encouraging thing to me is what he told me my purpose was, and it was love. I've realized that later on in life um, after going through a few things, but I know hands down that my purpose was to love other people through their stuff in whichever way. So as God knows your purpose, and I say this all the time, God is great, God is amazing, he knows everything. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Satan got a lot of knowledge too, and he's going to instantly try to destroy it. So for me, here we go, um, love was not something that was ever issued in my life, like at all. Um, so I was born into a family. I have two older brothers and a dad, I'm, well, and my mom passed away. But um, And it was like, it was almost like I was born into a family that like just didn't understand what love was. Um, it was just not something that was there. It was like, I call it a generational curse. It was like my great grandma didn't know how to love my grandma. My grandma didn't know how to love my mom. My mom didn't know how to love me. Um, <clears throat> from a very young age, this is when I probably cry or cuss, so I apologize. Um, I was sexually abused off and on for about 10, 11 years. Um, it changed me completely. Most people know me now as like loud and outgoing and obnoxious. You're welcome. But um, it's... <laughs> But when I was a child, I was so quiet. Like, I just didn't want to talk to anybody. I was like, I, you know, you're not loved. You're like, I don't have anything to offer. Um, my mom and I would fight mm, all the time. Like, I'm super sarcastic, like very witty. I try not to be sarcastic because it's negative. But if you say something dumb, I'm going to probably comment and, like, give you grief back. Like, that's just my personality. And so I remember we get... <laughs> It's not funny. It's kind of funny. I laugh about morbid stuff, so bear with me. But um, I remember one time we got in a really huge fight, and she was like, get out of my house. So I start walking to the door to get out, and she locked the door. And then I, and so I'm like, okay, you're giving me conflicting emotions. You want me to leave, but you lock the door. I don't know what to do. It causes more trouble. Don't be sar Kids, don't be sarcastic to your parents when you're in trouble. It doesn't help. Um, but so then there's physical abuse that happens. There's mental abuse. There's verbal abuse. From the sexual abuse, I literally ate my feelings. That's all I did. Um, I used to be a lot bigger than I am now because it's the only way I could cope with it when I was sad. I didn't understand my emotions. I remember when the abuse came out. Um, I grew up Catholic, um, so we went to church, like, once a week with school. My family wasn't really practicing. We were the Sunday, like, what do they call it, like, the holiday Catholic? Like, you have to go on Christmas. You have to go on Easter. Like, those are the important days. Um... And so I remember in confession when I confessed it and the priest was like, and <laughs> I tried to like disguise my voice to be like, I don't want you to know it's me. So I was like, I have been like, you know, sounding crazy, like 90% of what comes out of my mouth. Um, and he was like, well, sir, I encourage you to go back. And I was like, no, I'm a boy. Like, you know, and you just start like having that insecurity. But I remember when it came out in my family, um, I remember the reaction. So my poppy, who is a man that is dear to my heart, um, he gave me a hug while I was bawling, and then the rest of my family responded badly. For instance, um, you don't talk about it. You do not talk about it because it, it can ruin the family. You don't, you don't need counseling. Um, I remember um, my mom made up a story that she went through a rape, she, and she didn't need counseling, so I don't need it. So I was like, oh, I'll be fine. Um, 
another person in my family said if they were drunk, it didn't count, or I was sleeping. Another person in my family said, weren't they playing doctor? And I was like, that's an effed up version of what doctor is, so I hope not. But so there's so many responses that I had to that. You know, um, I remember in grade school, I had one friend. <laughs> Her name was Kristen. We started being friends in junior high. We got paired together dissecting owl pellets. So just through life's or through owl's stuff, we got to bond. So, you know, bonded over crap, literally. But um, we... <laughs> She was my first friend that ever liked me for me. I had an older, I had two older brothers that were both attractive, and they're both like sports stars and outgoing and whatnot. So all the girls were like, "Hi, I want to be your friend because I want to." And so I never had anybody for me. That was the first time I ever had a friend, and I started breaking out of my shell just a little bit. Fast forward about six years, she died in a car accident. I was completely lost. Um, reverse a little bit. Um, Going through high school, like, I was really quiet my freshman year. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> Some of you know me really well now. And senior year is when I kind of got involved with God. Um, I got invited to a youth event. It was a volleyball, like, lock-in. Um, and I played, and I met this girl named Emily. And she was so different than me, and I hope she listens to this. She, like, I'm, like, I'm tom girl. Like, I'll wear jeans and a T-shirt type thing all the time. I don't like to dress up. Obviously, I'm wearing shorts today. Um... But she was, like, in Jinkos, so, like, the oversized baggy, like, super dark hair. Like, I was, like, she might be emo. She might be goth. Like, I'm not quite sure, but she was the nicest person that I'd ever met. Um, and she kept inviting me. So I got to know God a little bit, studied the Bible. We did this, study the Bible, get baptized, and then see ya. Like, learn your life. Not a good way to do it. Um, so I kind of just got heavily involved in legalism of church, which I'm, I know a lot of people here are very much the legalistic standpoint on church. When life gets hard, you can't stand on legalism. You can't. Like, you can say you can, and I'm going to call you a liar. But you can't because legalism in, isn't going to be able to let you feel God's love. It's not possible. It's not. Um, so that happened. You know, your friend dies. And then I went through a whirlwind of trying to figure out my relationship with God. My mom got really sick. Now, mind you, I did not grow up with a mom that I loved. Like, I, I love her now, but then I didn't, I didn't want to be around her. I would not see her. If I saw her in the hospital, I wouldn't see her for a few months. I'd go visit her. Mother's Day, remember Claire's Day. Get to the hospital, walk in. First thing she says to me, I had psoriasis that was like covering my arms before. And she's like, your psoriasis looks like S-H-I-T. I won't say it. I'll spell it. It's better. Um, and you look like you gained 150 pounds. And I just remember, like just start crying and walk out. And I remember my dad said, this is why she doesn't visit you. You're just very negative to her. Um, I remember just my grandma always, like, trying to be in charge of my diet to get me to lose weight, but, n like, nobody ever addressed the issue of why I'm eating. Like, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel like I constantly have to go there? Um, I have different family members that always, they said they were concerned. Like, you ever have people that say they're concerned about your life and they want to know what's going on in your life, and then when you tell them what's going on in their life, they attack you, and you're like, that's not helpful, like, at all, like, in the slightest. That's the kind of family I come from a very, I'm a very honest person, but I come from a very abrasively honest person. Negative reinforcement. Um, so I struggled more. Um, I, when my mom, I remember the day my mom passed away, well, before my mom passed away, <laughs> she was in a nursing home, um, and she had her leg amputated, and we start talking, and I'm there, and she starts being rude, and I call her, I officially called her out on it, and, um, she, like, wanted to leave. Well, she was, <laughs> this makes me sound like a horrible person. She was missing a leg, so I took her wheelchair, and I pushed it out in the hallway. I was like, we're having this right now. You're not going anywhere. And it was not my finest moment at all. Um, we started fighting, like, not fist fighting, because that's, I'm pretty sure it's illegal. She was handicapped. But um, we started mentally, I told you I make really bad jokes because I get nervous. Um, we started verbally, like, just, like, yelling at each other, and, like, I'm crying. And she's like, you didn't, I didn't, you never asked me to be there. I was like, you're my freaking mom. How am I supposed to? I didn't know I was supposed to ask you to be there. You never came to any of my sports stuff. Always there for my brothers. Never there for me. And we had it out. And that was two weeks. And then she died. I was a hot mess when she died. A person that didn't even really love me, but she was my mom. She made. She had a pivotal role in my life. She passed away. I lost it. I lost my faith in God because based off of what I believed in legalism and what I believe now, still, I'm not sure if she's in heaven. And I had no idea how to address that at all. So I walked away from God, started partying. Um, I drank a lot. Line dancing is not evil, but I line danced a lot too. Um, and then um, I started smoking pot, um, just numbing things. Um, when my mom passed away, the abuse came out. And it was really rough for me. 
because it seemed like my whole family chose my abuser over me. For instance, like, well, we want this person to be here, so are you even able to go, or no, I won't go? Or birthday parties I was not told about, um, so I couldn't be around my family. Um, and I just thought, like, and it wasn't like it came out in a way to where I wanted anybody to be mad at my abuser, because that's not how it came. Like, that's not how, who I am. Um, but it was like, when your whole family chooses that person, and you're like, what's, this is where I cry or I cuss, so fair warning. Um, what's wrong with me? Why, why am I not lovable? Why, do, why, why can't I be lovable? Like, so when people to this day, you can ask them, they're like, I love you. I'm like, no, or I've heard a lot about you. I'm like, yeah, sorry. Like, it's probably a cuss word. I apologize. Like, um, but it's like when your family can't love you and they don't choose you, who does? If it's one of those things, it's like you, you, you constantly question anybody's motives. So that happened. Um, I threw myself back more into legalism. Stupidest thing I could have done. Um, and I couldn't figure out how to sort through things. And then I met a family that um, I nannied for. And I remember two weeks during Christmas, I didn't leave the bedroom. I didn't eat. There was a shower down there. Uh, there was a bathroom down there. I didn't come upstairs or anything. Um, they got a Wii Fit. Um, and they brought it downstairs to one of those giant big old TVs down there. Um, and they started playing. And I would lay in my bed and watch them. And then I'd sit up in my bed and watch them. And so slowly it pulled me out of it. And I started dealing with what was going on. Um, fast forward a lot more, I'll just do like a rapid fire. So the abuse came out, my abuser didn't want me to know anything about their life. Um, I was kind of cut out a little bit from my family. My mom passed away, my dad started dating a woman that, um, had a past. Um, she used to, I'll just say it, she used to be a stripper, which is, I mean, you have your past, but the way that she lives her life now and still lives her life is not in a good way. So he chose her family. So then he stepped into a role, which I was a daddy's girl, of being an amazing father to a 16-year-old. And me at 25, 26 years old was so pissed off and jealous because all I wanted was my dad to love me. And he didn't have anything to do with me. When my mom died, he had a really hard time dealing with it. He needed to take back and take time for himself to heal, and he could He didn't know how to do it, so he did it by not talking to me. I'm like, Cool. So I felt like I lost my dad, too. Um, I remember we had dinner for one of my birthdays, and he planned a trip to go visit my brother and his kids. And I was like, I don't have kids. We can't connect. And so I, got, I, got, I kept getting shifted. And I, my whole life with my family, I always do. Um, so my dad wasn't around. So then that relationship went kaplunk. Like, I remember my dad. And, Dad, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I'm just being vulnerable. I remember that one fight we had and it was just like this, it was just a really bad time for our whole family and we had a fight and I've said some things that I shouldn't have said and um, I remember him saying that he just doesn't want to ever talk to me again. And it was right before my birthday. And then I like, I just lost it and my friends were like, your dad does this sometimes, you guys have horrible fights. Like I joke and I say, my family fights in a way that's like, anybody ever play Mortal Kombat? Like you know how it's like a finish him move where it's like uppercut and the person goes flying? That's how my family fights. They will say the worst thing on the possible planet to make you shut up to make you, sh like, question everything so they win the fight. That's how they fight. I hate that. Um, and so that was one of the things that were said. And I just started bawling again, and I'm like, why doesn't anybody love me? Why can't I be loved? My grandma died. She raised me. She passed away. Before my grandma passed away, my best friend on the planet, her son, had a disease, and he passed away. I moved in with her. You know, blessing came. We got to talk a lot about God. She gave her life over to the Lord. Her husband came back from deployment. He gave his life over to the Lord. And just in the past year, her son gave his life over to the Lord. So your heart just, you're like, okay, this is what God's love is. He, he does restore through pain. And I'm still like, I'm good. Like, I taught an abuse class back home for like six or seven years. And I'm like, I got this. Like, I know what steps, the 12-step program to not want to, you know, punch your abuser. I got that down pat. Like, forgiveness, it's a big thing. Then my grandma died. And I realized that I have never dealt with anything properly. I have never taken the time for me. I have never worked things out with God. I'm just like, okay, this is what happened to me, so here's, here it is. And I never was vulnerable with God about me. And I was like, okay, so this happened, so I'm going to use it this way. Or I'm going to, we had a ministry called the Manasseh Ministry, and it was like grief share, sexual abuse, wounded heart, sexual abuse. And then it was like healing is a choice where it's like when you go through like verbal abuse. And I was like, I could lead the whole ministry like just by one story, so sweet, let's do this. And I was like, oh, purpose, purpose, which we do have purpose for our lives. I still didn't heal from my stuff. 
I still didn't think I was lovable. I still <laughs> struggle with it so hard. And I love the fact that everybody this morning came up to me like, I love you. I'm so excited. I'm like, no, okay. Like, thanks. Like, I still struggle with it. When I moved down here, I started going to a church. I started going to Suncoast. Um, and it was the best church for me at the time because I learned a lot about God's grace because, listen, I was that person where you did something. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you? The Bible says this. It's clear cut. No compassion, no grace. I was like in your face about your sin. If you're a Christian, like I was just an aggressive person. I learned a lot about it. I read a book, Jesus is by Judah Smith. I recommend that book to anybody that's legalistic. It's a little, it's funny, so I like it, but um, it's a really good book. Um, and then Suncoast fell apart. And I was like, and, but right before Suncoast fell apart, like literally days, my poppy, the one that hugged me through my abuse, he had a coughing fit and artery exploded and he died like back home. And I got a phone call and my, I literally remember my dad calling me and I was bawling while I was laying in bed. And I took the next couple of days off work and I was getting ready to have a surgery. I couldn't go home, all these things. And my heart was just shattered again. And I'm like, God, why are the people that you do put in my life? Like my mom, or not my mom, my grandpa, my best friend, my best friend's son that love me. Why do you, why do you keep taking them away? Like, why can't you? And I remember falling on my knees one time saying, could you just put somebody to love me for who I am? Like that song, um, JJ Keller or Heller or something, love me for who I am, that song. Like I heard that song and I lost it. I was like, okay, would it go to insane asylum now? Like mental breakdown, 100%. I was like, why can't I have anybody love me? And I got to know Brian, who sings amazingly. He plays whatever instrument this is. I used to call his, uh, what was it, the cello? I call it the viola. No, did I, what did I, I can't remember what I called. I called it the wrong thing, and he just looked at me like I was crazy. But um, I was like, oh, it's the stand-up violin. I think that's what I called it. And he's like, nope, that's not an inter- instrument. Um, and he brought me to Bayshore. Now, when I came to Bayshore, I was like, you go to a Mennonite church. <laughs> like, I'm so far from Mennonite, it's not even funny. Like, people dress in, the, you know, they have their coverings. Um, people don't wear shorts all the time. Um, people are very big on, you know, things. I'm like, I'm not going to fit in. And I walk in the door, and I remember somebody was like, you have holy shorts on, because I had shorts that have holes in them. And I was like, they're my Sunday jeans. And, like, you know, just things like that. Different comments made about me wearing hats. I'm like, you wear a bonnet. Like, it's okay. Like, we all have head coverings sometimes. And I was like, I'm not going to fit in at this church. I'm loud. I'm obnoxious. And I have never felt more at peace about being at a church than I did when I walked through the doors. Um, I got to meet Josiah and his family. I got to meet Pam and Clayton and their family. And um, it just was like the attractiveness of family was important to me. And I saw that people loved each other here. And I was like, okay. So fast forward a little bit, just I invited me on an encounter, and that's when all heck broke loose. You Listen, I know that we're not trying to plug these encounters sometimes, but go on one if you've ever been through anything in life because it helps you walk through it. But I remember on my encounter, I started walking through my abuse, and I just started bawling. And I was like, I literally have taught women how to process this. It didn't matter. Sure, you can process it, but do you heal just because you process it? If you talk to somebody because they offend you and you're like, you offended me. Okay, cool, we're done. No, you still have emotions. You still have to fight. You still have to ra- ra- wrestle with God for that, for, to fight what Satan says. For me, after my encounter is when I felt a lift come. I felt I'm okay now. I'm okay. I'm like, all right, I'm doing good. I have, I moved to Florida. Life is great. Yeah, okay. I get a disease where water, water, not water. I wish it was water. Fluid stores in my brain. Apparently, there's something really valuable in here that God's trying to protect. So he puts fluid on my brain. Questionable by any words that come out of my mouth, but that's true. But literally, like, I have this disease. And I'm like, cool, let's contract that disease. And then I have to have surgery. And then I have surgery. They put a shunt in my spine. Uh, it goes horribly wrong. It overshunts me, and I'm on bed rest for like a week and a half. And we go back to the doctor. Gina takes me back to the doctor, and he's like, it has to come out. And then he's like, by the way, we can't do a brain shunt, which is the only other option that I had because your ventricles are too small. And when you, if your ventricles are too small with a brain shunt, they have to remove your brain. Listen, again, if you've heard me talk, I need all of my brain. I don't need you to take any parts of it away. <laughs> like, it's not good. And I remember crying. Actually, it was actually really funny because I made this joke with Gina. We were sitting in there. She's like, only you, Anne. But um, we were sitting there and he's like, your ventricles are too small. And he walked out and I looked at Gina and I go, that's the first time a doctor has ever, seen, ever said something on me is too small. I'm really excited about this. And she just was like, seriously? I was like, sorry. I'm just trying to look at the blessings or the, you know, the hidden encouragement. Um, and that happened. I'm like, seriously? Like, seriously, God? You know, I used to be able to go to, when I, the Holy Spirit is very big in my life. 
I grew up Catholic. That's not a thing. You didn't, we had one song where we clapped our hand one time, and it was like the most amazing thing. So this isn't a thing. The Holy Spirit was not a thing for me, like at all. Sure, the Holy Spirit is peace. That's how it was always preached to me. He's quiet. He's timid. You never preach it like he's a fire, like he is, he's the fire. He's your conscience. There's so many different ways of the Holy Spirit besides just the peace. I could go to a Holy Spirit place where I could sit there and be like, what's wrong right now? I'm not in a good spot. And I could see, here comes, okay, you all know I'm a nerd now. Anybody ever play Zelda on the Wii? Like, you know how the wisp happens? That was the Holy Spirit for me. Like, that's how I view my Holy Spirit. It's a little guy that's like, ah, or whatever noise he makes and all that stuff. Um, yeah, that was a really good impersonation of that voice. I apologize. Um, when I got out of my surgery, I was excited that I didn't die. By the way, I tried to die. Like, I stopped breathing on the operating table. So we joke in my leadership ministry. It's a joke. They were like, oh, God's like, nope, we don't want her. And then one of my friends is like, Satan's like, yeah, we don't want her either. So I'm stuck here forever, apparently. But um, I was I was lost. I, was, I wasn't lost with God. I was just nervous. I was like, I don't know what my purpose is now because if I'm not healed, I don't know what's going to happen. So I took a sabbatical, as I joked, from church for a little bit, even though you're a volunteer. But I was like, I need a minute. Like, I can't. Like, I, I got to take some time with God. And I had the place where I could go with my Holy Spirit. And I remember when I could go there, it was gone. And I was like, like, it's like walking around rubble in my mind and like in my dreams. And I'm like, where did it go? Does that mean I'm not with God anymore? And then it took like a, probably a good almost few weeks or a month before I could get back to where I was in a, like a canoe. And it was like the CSDP pretty water. And I was like going deep into the jungle. And I was like, I'm just going to go off a waterfall. This is God showing me that I'm just going to fall off a waterfall. And it wasn't. And it's like he took me a little bit deeper with him. Um, I can, when I go to my place now, I can see the people that I know are filled with the Holy Spirit. I can sense what's going on. Now, back up just a little bit. Those are all the things that happen to me. They don't define me. My sexual abuse does not define me. My verbal, mental, physical abuse doesn't define me. The way my family still to this day sucks at loving. I dyed my hair platinum blonde. I used to be really brunette. First thing my brother says to me, you dyed, well, I'm not going to say what he said because that's going to be a lot of bleeps, and I don't know if they have a meet, mute button up there. But um, he's like, you dyed your flipping hair to look like that flipping Megan Rapinoe soccer chick and blah, 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 blah. Like, I was like, what? It's been dyed like this for months. And he was like, no. He was like, everybody thinks that. I was like, you psycho. Nobody thinks that but you. Calm down. And that was like the first time I'd seen him in a year and a half after I dropped everything when he had a heart attack, who I don't talk to him very often, and drove up there. And I said, you know, I had a rough year. I tried to die. I've lost weight. He goes, you still look bad. You need to get, or you still got a lot of weight to lose. I'm just like, you can't win. You know, that just happened a month ago when I was around my family and back with that negativity. And I came back and I started praying about it. And I was like, God, again, <laughs> like, what do I have to do for my family to love me? Like, what? I thought I was funny. I know I say questionable things sometimes, but I think I'm kind of funny. I'm very compassionate. I love people. What's wrong with me? And you start getting triggered with that. I remember years ago when God gave me the vision of you're supposed to love. And I'm like, for real? Like, really good examples in my life have learned how, is that how I'm supposed to love people? Like, I'm going to end up in jail. Like, what am I going to do? And it's like, you're supposed to love. And I was like, cool. Cool. Like, literally, cool story, bro. Okay. And I was just like, this is not going to be me. There's no way. I don't know what love is. And the moments when God showed me what his love was is when other people opened up about their stuff. Now, this church, um, not everybody, but it's known for Mennonite cultures. We don't talk about stuff. It's not a thing. We are not vulnerable of where we're at. We just say, yeah, we're good. How's life? People ask me all the time. It's actually really funny when Sunny comes up to me and she's like, how are you doing? I'm like, horrible. And I just lay it out there. She's like, thank you for being real. I was like, you're good. Like, I'm good now, but I'll be honest with people about how I am. The reason why you have to be honest and you have to be vulnerable is because people can't love you if you're not honest and you're not vulnerable. I need this. Let's say I need this today, okay? If I'm not asking for this or if I'm not being vulnerable, people aren't going to know that that need needs to be met. You know, Andy's been talking about reaching out to people today and, like, how we're supposed to reach out. The Bible talks about going and making disciples of all nations. We're supposed to be bringing people in. We're supposed to be inviting people in. Anybody ever have anybody invite you in where they act like their life is perfect and you instantly are like, I have, I can't relate to you. You suck. I hate that your life's perfect. Now, now I'm struggling with envy and jealousy and like all the other bad ones. Thank you. You're causing me to sin more. I don't want to come hang out with you. We're supposed to be vulnerable. We're supposed to be real. God led me to be a person of love. I've volunteered on a lot of different ministries. I work with our youth ministry with, our, um, I worked with the youth ministry here. I work with our young adult ministry with my CTM group. 
He calls me to love. But Satan said, no, I'm going to screw it up from day one. And God's like, no, no, you're not. And so what did I have to do? I had a choice that I had to make. You know, anybody in their right mind could be like, don't ever talk to your family again. <laughs> don't ever talk to your abuser again. Don't ever, you don't even have to actually let people in. I understand why you would not ever talk to anybody about your life because every time you try to trust somebody, they abuse it. Anybody, any, even counselors are like, I actually would give you some free passes to never do that. I have friends that are counselors. Like, why do you talk to your family? I don't know. I don't know. Because God created me to love and God created me to forgive. I don't want my abuser to go, I, every day I pray in this prayer, I say, God, I want to intercede and I have forgiven even though they haven't asked for forgiveness. Please don't hold them to that. Why do I do that? I don't know, because I'm crazy. I literally, boundaries are not a thing for me usually. God told me I had to love. I had to fight through so many emotions of abuse, of not being loved, not feeling wanted, not being wanted around, to the point to where if people forgot to invite me places, I'm like, they hate me, they don't want me. Now I'm like, don't invite me. I don't want to go. I like to be alone. Like, leave me alone. But I, I got to that point to where I had to figure out what was said to me. What did I go through? What, was, what did Satan put in me? What did Satan put around me? And then what did God say? You know, God says he created me for a purpose. He created me for love. Okay. So then here's my life. I'm like, hmm, one of these don't match up. You know, Josiah, and I don't know if he's here, and I, if he is, I can't see him, but he said to me something one day, and it will forever stay with me. This is like, you put a, you're typing into a computer, you're like, this was what is inputted, and you press print, and something prints, and you're like, what the flip is this? And that's how I like my life. Because if you hear my story, you hear all of these things that have happened to me that have tried to destroy everything in my life of what I stand for. And then it's like, but here's my print button. And it gets filtered through God. Sometimes some bad things come out. I apologize. It's my mouth. But it comes out being God, and it's God's love. If you know what your purpose is, and if you don't, let's say you don't know your purpose, because it took me a while to figure mine out. Usually your strength is your weakness, just a heads up. So if you have a weakness in something, that's supposed to be your strength. Sometimes that sucks royally, <laughs> and I apologize. If you don't like your weakness, just work with it. Work with God. Ask for that wisdom. But when you use it, and when you use your purpose with God, there's something that heals every single time. For instance, this trip back home, I came back and I was like a hot mess. I was like, I called my friend Brandon. I was like, I have to come see your dog because I can't life and I just need to hold Milton because I can't, I just need, I need, I need love. And I just, I wasn't okay. But the cool part is, is where my relationship with God is at right now. Those boxes that I always say all my crap's in a box, like he said baggage, and I was like, I'm worse than Southwest. I have like eight jets full of like baggage. I'm like, sure, sign up for this crazy. It's a great time. But those boxes stayed home this time and home in Illinois. They, th those words, those feelings, those negativity that are those negativities, whatever, those English words, all of the things stayed back home because God is like, you are loved and you're going to be loved and you're going to love. I don't, I don't know how to explain how many people when I talk about my story, and I gave a brief version of it, so if anybody wants more details, don't talk to me today, but I will talk to you about it, um, has created the opportunity for other women to open up about their stuff. You know, um, sexual abuse, unfortunately, it's like one in four, one in three women. Guys, it's like one in four, one in five. It's a very common thing nowadays. Parents saying the wrong thing. It's going to happen. Me as a youth leader, I'm pretty sure I've, <laughs> I had to apologize to Julie one time, I think because I told her that Dawson was like a butt face or something. I can't remember what I said, but I told her I said something. I was like, not something a youth pastor should say to your kid. I really don't think he's a butt face. I think he's a very attractive kid. I'm not hitting on your kid. Now it's just getting weird. I don't know what to say. Like, I just went downhill, but I remember that conversation with her because I was like, that I'm just real, but <laughs> yeah, questionable things I say. Um, I just know that when you open up, about who you are, and you don't act like you have it all together, people can love you properly, and you can actually get the help that you need. When you talk about your life, when you talk about your stories, when you talk about your pain, I hate crying. I hate it with a passion. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. It's good to cry. It's good to get that out. And you cannot do it walk alone. You cannot walk alone. You're not, it, you, you're literally, the Bible was, like says we were created, he created Adam a wife. I don't know if that was for more turmoil or what it was for, but he didn't want him to walk alone. He wanted him to have relationship. That's what we're created for. You can reach people by your story, whether it's something psychotic as mine, because it's a little crazy, 
or whether it's just when you learned to fall in love with God. You didn't have any of the crazy that happened, but this is your moment in life when you fell in love with God. There's people, we can relate to all kinds of people out there, but if we don't ever talk about our stuff, if we don't ever open up to each other, each other, importantly, like we're talking about home church, we don't open up to each other. How are we going to open up to strangers? You know, we, my favorite thing ever is when I hear people, when they, when I've used my story and they've used their story and you just see the ripple effect that it has and it makes, it makes you encouraged. And it's not like, yay, like I went through that. Cause I'm like, I think of James, like the Bible verse, James one, two through four. And I'm just like, consider it pure joy. It doesn't say you have to like it. Like, cause I don't like anything that's ever happened to me, but God's blessed all of it because I chose to seek him through it. And I chose to fight with him. And not all of it was pretty. Like there was some curse words that were said to God. And I was fighting, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out my obedience and trying to figure out my relationship with him. I just, my encouragement, and I'm done because I'm pretty sure I went over 10 minutes, but um, be, I'm just taking one from Andy, speaking a little bit longer than I should. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I have to because I'm super nervous. I'm sorry. Um, but be vulnerable and be honest with where you're at. And don't judge people for where they're at because if it, it, it takes anything to be honest and vulnerable, they don't need somebody to judge them. Like, they don't need to be criticized. They need to be loved and encouraged and walked with. You know, sometimes we're at, you know, the Bible talks about we're running the race, and it's like sometimes I'm up here, and I have some friends that are back here, and I'm like, I hate running anyway, so I'll come back here, and then I walk with them through their stuff. Sometimes I'm like, come on, like, you actually can run, get up. And then there's sometimes when you have to sit there on the ground with them while they're pouring their heart out and sit with them and help them stand up together and walk slowly with them by holding their hand because they just crashed and burned so hard that they feel like they've done something pivotally wrong. You know, as a Christian, I sin all the time. That's why everybody, I'm like, grace is such a good thing because if I didn't have it, God would be like, I would be, I would just live on the mountain with like all of the animals that I sacrifice because I would have to sacrifice every five seconds because I screw up like all the time. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for not having to do that because I don't like to kill things with my hands. Um, but walk with people, talk with them, find out what's going on in their life. And this is another big thing. Somebody gives you their testimony or somebody talks to you about what's going on, don't be like, hey, they, I challenged a friend. They're like, yeah, they gave me a, they told me this, like some stuff that was going on. It was a really good conversation. I'm like, cool, did you follow up? They're like, wait, what? And I'm like, what? Like when you give somebody your testimony, you tell them something that's going on, you like, <sighs> sorry, I'm apologizing now. It's like when you tell something and it's like somebody sees you like open and exposed and you're just like, okay, I've opened my heart out to you. And then if you don't ever follow up, you, your mind goes rampant about what are they thinking about. Like, oh, my gosh, they're probably judging me because of this, this, and this. Follow up. Hey, I was thinking about you. Hey, this meant a lot to me. Keep following up. That's how the relationship happens. Not a one-time dump and then, okay, bye. Like, it's not, no, because then you're going to avoid eye contact with that person for the rest of their lives because I've done it. I'm like, okay, bye. Like, if I don't see you, look you in the eye today, it's because I'm a little nervous. But follow up with them. Love them. Encourage them. You know, God had a plan for me to love, and Satan said, let's screw it up from birth. And he didn't because he had a purpose for my life. And I wanted his purpose more than I wanted what the world wanted. And I fight it every day. And you can fight it too. It's not easy. I know as Mennonite culture, we don't fight much. That's why I don't fit in again. Um, but uh, some things are worth fighting for. And fighting for your relationship with God when all heck breaks loose. And I'm glad I said heck right there. It's okay. Just have people around you to fight with you. Because if you don't, it's a very, 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 very lonely walk with God. And I'm going to tell you this, the people that you're trying to bring in, you don't know what they're going through. And if you act like you have it all together, they're not going to open up to you. They're not. You know, our ministry, when we were in the young adult ministry, grew a lot because of vulnerability. It, things grow because of vulnerability, because you're real. We come in a world where there's Instagram filters, there's like awesome memes, all those things where we can cover everything that we want. Mm -mm. Nobody wants that. We have enough in the world of people not being real, and the church is the one place we're supposed to be real. We're supposed to come where, like, there's that thing where, well, they don't have it together there. Well, good. Like, we all fit in, and, like, we're not supposed to. Well, there's hypocrites there. Yep, everybody is. And the only person that wasn't was Jesus. So, sorry. Like, what do you want me to say to that? Like, it's okay. Like, we're all learning. But find somebody that you can be open with. I encouraged a youth kids a long time ago. Grace, I'm calling you out. Like, but we talked about having somebody you could talk to about stuff. Like, have one person, one person. You, if you're me and you've got a lot of crap, it's like, I have about 10, so that way I can, like, maneuver and be like, I don't want to be too much for you, so this issue goes to this person. But you have to have one person you can talk to about. And I remember, like, I'm like, maybe that didn't reside with any of the girls. And not maybe a year ago, at most, 
she sent me a text. She's like, I just want to let you know I have my person now, and I have somebody that can talk to you. And, it, and I encourage, it's like family's great. If you're married, definitely talk to your, I'm not trying to even cause any divisions. Talk to your wife. Talk to your husband. Have a, if you're a girl, have a good girlfriend. If you're a guy, have a good guy friend. You have to have somebody else besides just that one person. But that's my encouragement to you. I hope I'm done. So take the microphone for me, please. Thank you. Let's pray real quick. Thank you, Ann. Father God, I just thank you for Ann. Lord, I thank you for um, her testimony, Lord, and her heart. Father, for the things that you've walked with her through and the grace and the redemption that you've shown her on the other side of that. And just praise you and thank you for that. And just pray, Lord, as a church, we would be encouraged and we would walk out of here differently because of her story. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Ann.